All right, well, you are looking at the TSX north of 22,100. It is just a number, but it identifies a market that has made its way into record territory for the first time since 2022. We've been watching this closely over the last few weeks, the fact that steadily the market rally that we've talked so much about in the U.S., led by technology stocks, and which has benefited Canadian stocks, has broadened out to other sectors. We saw industrials and financials as the first part of that leg last year into this year, and now a lot of the commodity stocks also finding their groove. So here we are in record territory, and joining us on set, Ryan Bushell, President and Portfolio Manager at New Haven Asset Management. Ryan, um, I, it's kind of like a you know, a slow race to the technical record level, but what's your reaction? I think it's surprising, especially given the financial sector is still well below all-time highs. I mean, I think Royal Bank might be close to an all-time high, but but broadly speaking, the banks are well below all-time highs, and that's been the big kind of power sector for the TSX for the last, I don't know, few decades. Um, but if you look, energy stocks are, are perking up. You've got uh, CNQ, biggest energy stock in Canada now, all-time highs. Um, gold is starting to move. Um, you are starting to see that um, enthusiasm brought into commodities, which I think is interesting given everything that's going on with the U.S. fiscal situation. Is it also interesting that you have questions about Canada's economy, people crossing their fingers, yeah. hoping that we'll see interest rates and that you've got the stock market at a record high? I mean, you can't have a um, big downturn without an all-time high, right? So mm. my, my view, I'm not trying to be too ominous, but uh, I, I do think that there is trouble ahead. Um, so this might be, you know, Take a picture of it, and we'll, we'll see where we're at in a year from now. So when you say trouble ahead, are you talking about the economy, the stock market, or both? I think both. Mm. Um, you know, it's interesting. You've got this huge fiscal impulse globally, especially in the United States, and, and less so in Canada. And so that's that's continuing to push markets and push the economy. If Without that that huge deficit spending, we'd be pretty close to a recession. And, and if you look at the Fed's commentary from yesterday, they're keeping three rate cuts in view, but strengthening their economic projections. So something's going to have to give there eventually. Um, and if the market doesn't get those rate cuts that we're looking for, again, you know, last year we were anticipating cuts in the back half of 2023. We didn't get them. Now we're anticipating cuts in the back half of 2024. We didn't get them. I'm just not sure what the market's discounting at these levels. Now, I literally just had a conversation with a former Fed official who who didn't bat me off when I brought up the idea of a Goldilocks economy in the United States, just based on what the Fed is thinking about, what the numbers say right now. So I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to um, assess that with what you're saying right now. Yeah. Is, what's the disconnect? So the disconnect is, you know, we just don't know how long this fiscal spending can keep going on without them losing control of the long end of the curve. So you saw yesterday, the big news in the Fed commentary yesterday was Jerome Powell saying, we are going to taper the pace of quantitative tightening, meaning we are going to be selling less um, 10 year bonds or, or, or longer term bonds into the marketplace. But you still have this huge fiscal deficit, record bond issuance from the Treasury that is going to push more supply into that market. And with Japan raising rates for the first time in a long time, you're losing some of that carry trade where Japanese investors would buy US bonds, hedge the currency instead of buying their own domestic bonds. That spread is compressed. So if they lose control of the long end, that will hurt the economy. And, and it's just really a matter of time. And then you're looking at a situation where potentially they have to go back to quantitative easing. So, you know, to me, again, I think it's very fragile right now. It's it's kind of like everything's in balance for now, but things could change quickly given the, the, the just the magnitude of the numbers at play. I'm glad you brought up the balance sheet story, too, because we are awaiting a speech from the deputy governor of the Bank of Canada today. A lot of people on Bay Street have been waiting for this because um, there is a view that the quantitative tightening, so not to get too inside <laughs> baseball here, but the Bank of Canada, like the U.S. Fed, had been raising interest rates. They're fighting inflation, but they had also been paring back the size of their balance sheet, which got quite big during the pandemic, quantitative easing. So they'd been doing this quantitative tightening. But as part of this potential worry about the economy, they're they're starting to dial that back. And the bond market's been pounding the table for more details from the bank on what their plan's going to be. So we'll wait to see. But it sounds like the market thinks by the summertime we could be in some kind of quantitative easing situation. Yeah. And, and the question will be, right, Will the inflation numbers continue to cooperate? We're mm. we're seeing them stall out here, right? We you know it's come down from seven, eight, nine percent to th three or four percent, but we got we still have a ways to go. We're still, you know, one point five to two times where we 
you know where the targets are for the central banks. So, yeah. so again, it, the, the credibility of the Fed is on the line, and the credibility of the Bank of Canada similarly. But it's very hard for them because the tools they have don't fight the f- type of fiscal spending that we're seeing. And so, you know, again, it's it's a matter of how long can this go on before something breaks. Okay, I know you always bring stock picks to the table. Everyone's always curious. We're going to get to those in just a second. But first, stock market in Canada now at an all-time high. You sound a little bit skeptical about the continued potential gains. Broadly speaking, you think the TSX is higher or lower by the end of this year? Boy, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to say. I, I think it will really depend on where the economy goes. I, I don't foresee a lot of upside from here unless you see the financials start to participate. And so the question will be, are we feeling good about those mortgage renewals as we head into 2025? And, and I think that's the major question for the TSX, combined with you know what happens with oil prices. But I think oil prices as well are a little bit extended here. So so I'm not too optimistic. Um, you know, based on our portfolio composition, we're very defensive. We do not participate as much when times are so good like this. But uh, we're prepared and, and doing our homework for for what may be coming. All right. And just for our audience, financials over the last six months have outpaced the TSX, but so far in 2024, they are lagging. So that uh, speaks to your point about the bank stocks. Energy infrastructure is an area that you, uh, I don't know how much time you allocate to. I would say a probably the, the highest percentage of your time yep. goes there. Uh, let's just show our audience some of the names you brought to the table today, ideas uh, on the investment front, Fortis, TC Energy, Brookfield Renewable. Is there a common thread here? So the common thread really is just is power demand, but there's some interesting stats coming out. So Intel um, plans to spend $100 billion. That news came out, I think, Wednesday or, or Tuesday on semiconductor production in the United States. So each semiconductor fab takes roughly a gigawatt of energy per year. That's basically equivalent to a nuclear plant or basically more than an oil refinery. So if you think about oil refineries, we haven't built an oil refinery. I think we built one since 1977 in the United States. So $100 billion of of spending is is going to boost power demand quite a bit. And then once these chips come online, each one of these major AI large language model chips consumes about as much power as the average North American. So if we're building, you know, a million chips a year, two million chips a year, three million chips a year, it's like adding to the population and we're adding to the population. So power demand is coming from all different sources. Um, All three of these companies support um, different parts of the power demand chain in North America. Um, And by the way, I'm really glad you have, you've been one of the few who has brought this up on several occasions because we talk AI all day. We talk a lot less about the power required to fuel yeah. our technology world. And we're on an exponential curve here, right? The, now, again, I, I think that a lot of this investment, just like in, in new, nascent technologies of the past, whether you look at railways in the 1700s or um, manufacturing in the early 1900s, especially as it relates to automobiles and, and the internet in 2000, you get this period of, of unbridled enthusiasm and overinvestment. Um, but but it's hard to say where that's going to stop and how many of these chips are going to be in service you know, five years from now. Um, it's creating a tremendous amount of power demand alongside a whole bunch of other factors, geopolitical manufacturing moving back, cooling demand, climate change, people moving south, warm temperatures moving north, creating cooling demand. All of this creates tremendous stress on our energy system in North America, and it's a system that's been underinvested in for decades. So when I look at the safest places to allocate capital, we certainly don't want to own bonds. We're worried about the U.S. fiscal and Canadian fiscal situation and them losing control of their balance sheet. We're worried about technology valuations being too high based on this period of overinvestment. But this power demand thesis, to me, is in the, in the middle road. It's, it's assets that will continue to have value and produce value, we think, for decades for our clients. 